Welcome to The Controversial Truth, where we bring you content on health and wealth that nobody would ever tell you until now. I'm your host, Dr. Victoria Munoz, and today we have a very special guest for you. Mecca Wagner-Brown is an alternative therapy practitioner. She offers a variety of services outside of traditional talk therapy. Her main services consist of hypnotherapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, and emotional freedom technique. She also coaches clients on mindfulness, self-exploration, breathwork, and meditation. Mecca comes with a variety of accomplishments. She has a Bachelor of Science degree in Psychology and Kinesiology. She is a certified hypnotherapist and emotional freedom technique practitioner. She is also certified as a yoga teacher and Qigong practitioner. She is the author of two books, and she is one of the founding members and facilitators for Vision Journaling Live. She is also chair of the board of directors of Crescent Freedom Project International, which is a parent nonprofit of Vision Journaling Live. Mecca has been fully dedicated to her practice for the past three years after leaving corporate America. In her free time, Mecca enjoys time with her daughter, her three rescue pit bulls, and her partner. She also enjoys gardening, reading, and cooking. Please help me to welcome Mecca Wagner Brown. so much for being here today and an alternative therapy practitioner that's a very unusual title uh, so tell me a little bit about that what is alternative therapy practitioner so alternative therapy practitioner is a title I created um, it may not be unique other people may have used it but um, it's different than a psychologist or other licensed counselors that use um, so very specific techniques and processes when helping people. Um, people are used to the talk therapy or desensitization therapy when it comes to trauma. Um, I use hypnotherapy, emotional freedom techniques, and cognitive behavioral therapy that can cross over into those other therapist fields. Um, and I combine that with even some other things such as helping people learn how to meditate, um, how to be mindful, which is also tied into cognitive behavioral therapy, um, bringing that mindfulness in, the meditation, and then if they're open, I also offer Qigong and yoga to help them with their energy if that's something they're interested in and something I think that they can benefit from. So explain mindfulness to me because mm -hmm. that can be kind of a big question in a lot of people's mind. What does it mean to yes. be mindful and how how do you uh, implement that into your practice? You know, a lot of people are using the word mindfulness or being mindful, uh, and it's being thrown around a lot, and um, people can take different interpretations from it. But what it really means is that there are four foundations to being mindful. Number one is the most obvious, which is being fully present and living 100% your life. A lot of people move through their days almost on autopilot. Mm -hmm. You know, they get up, they have their routine, they make their coffee, they might pack their lunch, they get ready for work, they drive to work, they work, they come home, they, and it just keeps going and it repeats and repeats. And so they're like, oh, the week has gone by, this whole month has gone by. Because when you're in this state of being unaware, mm -hmm. time passes so quickly and you wonder where the time went or how you spent that time. But when you're mindful, you completely bring yourself into the present moment and you participate 
in your life. Instead of instead of letting your life carry you. So <clears throat> it could be something like washing your dishes. Mm -hmm. You know, some people are washing their dishes thinking about all the things they have to do when they're done washing the dishes. But instead, just take a moment to be aware of washing the dishes. I'm, I'm washing the dishes, the feeling of the water, the soap, the plates. You know, if you take a moment instead of when you wake up, jumping out of bed, getting going, brushing your teeth, maybe taking a shower and so on, sit for a moment on the edge of your bed and think about your gratitude, right? I am awake another day in my life and I have an opportunity. My whole day is a blank page in the book of my life and I get to create whatever I want. Yes, I have things I have to do because it's part of my life, but I can make it what I want. And so taking those moments, even when you're finished brushing your teeth, look yourself in the eyes, in the mirror, and say, today's gonna be good. It's gonna be a great day. Um, when you make your coffee, stop for five minutes and just go outside, or look outside, because it is kind of hot right now. Yes, but, it is. <laughs> you know, look outside and take in the beauty of nature and how the tree in your backyard is always there always present, always steady, always grounded, whether you're at work or you're at home, it's always there. And just kind of give yourself those moments. And then part of the other steps of being mindful is consistency. You have to be consistent to start to create a habit. Um, and creating those habits of being mindful means that you don't have to think about it which is part of the cognitive behavioral therapy, mm -hmm. right? You don't have to think about, okay, I need to stop and be grateful for my day. Okay, I need to stop and I need to be mindful and have my cup of coffee and mm -hmm. take in nature. It will just become part of you. And that's where the mindfulness starts coming in is participating in your life, not feeling like you're being carried by your life. Yeah, and so, most people have their thoughts are in the past or in the future, not in the moment. So sure. it seems like mindfulness be something that brings us into the present moment because that's really yes. all that exists. That's really all that's real. Absolutely. Yeah. The only thing you can control is right now. And a lot of people are struggling right now with depression and anxiety and it's on the rise, mm -hmm. especially with the younger generations. Um, and depression resides in the past anxiety resides in the future. Uh -huh. So anticipating what if, what could, what, you know, that's the anxiety, you know, and the past is where the depression is, where you have guilt and regret and shame and, you know, you wish you would have, right? right? Mm -hmm. um, but instead of that, I help people let that go and heal the past, uh -huh. come into the present and accept whatever the future holds. Yeah, so mindfulness is, is, it seems like it's also a part of meditation too. When you say mind, mindfulness and meditation can be like coexist. Absolutely, yeah. they can coexist. Yeah. Um, but you don't have to, you know, meditation scares some people, yeah. you know. <laughs> they they say, I can't meditate, you know. Um, <laughs> everyone can meditate, but you don't have to meditate to be mindful. Right, right. Yeah. Um, you can be mindful when you're eating and sitting and really taking your first bite and how does it taste? How does it feel going down? And when you're mindful in eating, it engages your parasympathetic nervous system. Right. And that's where you can digest better and you don't get indigestion as much mm -hmm. and acid reflux and such. But a lot of people are eating on the run or they're working and eating and so their sympathetic nervous system is in play and they're not being mindful of what they're eating mm -hmm. and you know things just, get thrown off balance people wonder why am I gaining weight and why you know but then they eat my maybe they eat a big meal with friends they laugh they have a good time and the next morning they weigh themselves they're like I lost weight how'd that happen <laughs> <laughs> because you actually ate a meal where you were relaxed you were enjoying yourself and sharing energy with other people and and it helps your body and people don't realize just those little shifts of mindful mindful eating mindful walking, all of that 
it plays a part in your happiness and health. Mm -hmm. And have you heard of the Heart Math Institute? I have not. Well, the Heart Math Institute, they've done a lot of research on how the there's a brain heart connection. Mm. They've actually discovered that there's okay. about 40,000 neurons in a location on the heart that mimic brain cells. Mm. So the, the heart has its own memory, its own brain. In fact, there's been accounts of heart surgeons who have patients coming back saying, my personality's changed, I have different likes that I didn't have before. Sure. And through their discovery, they found that these patients had taken on some of the characteristics of the donor heart that mm, they received mm -hmm. in a heart transplant. So the Heart Math Institute has done a lot of research, extensive research on the heart and its aura, mm -hmm. that its aura is like 60 times that of the brain. So when we have, when we're feeling, not thinking, but feeling gratitude right. and love, it affects people around us. And it's estimated that if 1% of the world started practicing gratitude, mm -hmm. um, meditation, that it could change the 99%. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, um, you know, I, I love that you brought that up because when I teach people gratitude, I tell them, this isn't a list. It isn't you sitting on the edge of your bed saying, I'm grateful for the home I have. I'm grateful <laughs> for my children. I'm grateful for my car. I'm grateful for my job. Sure, you can be grateful for that, but that's not the practice. Right. The practice is feeling mm -hmm. that gratitude. Feeling, allowing yourself to just feel grateful for this day, for just being here and let it just rise up inside you and just set the tone for the day with that emotion. Right. So feeling it in your heart, mm -hmm. that is what I try to teach people. And it's hard for people to grasp that concept. So I give them, I have a, a statement. I say, okay, it's a fake it until you make it, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I say, here's a statement. If you're really struggling, just say this statement. And I give it to them and I say, just keep it there by your bed, you know, and read it in the morning. And then pretty soon, try not to read it, but just let let it rise up. Uh -huh. And then eventually you won't have to read it. You'll, You'll just, just automatically feel it. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And the more we tell ourselves something, the more we believe it. And Absolutely. it's really not here, it's on a cellular level yeah. where that belief exists. Absolutely. So when I teach consciousness and uh, the difference between the conscious subconscious mind mm -hmm. the subconscious mind actually lives in the cells of the body and yes. that's 95 percent of every automatic thing that we do all day so absolutely when people are going through their day on autopilot they're not really changing they'll be the same in 10 years from now yes. if they don't mindfully focus on making a change or doing something different and that's what i tell people is that your subconscious is like your computer program. Mm -hmm. If you just let the computer program run, it'll just keep running. Running. How it's programmed. Right. Over and over and over. So when people say, I don't know why I keep doing this one bad habit, you know, mm -hmm. choosing the wrong people or you know, following the same patterns, it's because you're not making a conscious effort to change that. Right. And to change it, you have to figure out what is driving it. And so that's when I help people. So there's a little bit of talk. I mean, we do talk in sure. yeah. session, right? And we back up and we try to figure out where is this coming from? Uh -huh. When did this start? When's your earliest memory when this started? And we keep figuring that out and going back and going back and then we start to find the triggers and we start to heal those and then making conscious effort to change and they find you know my clients find that they're more aware of when something's going to happen now uh -huh. instead of it just going and then it's too late oh i just did it you know yeah right um and because we've healed all those triggers so now the program doesn't know what to do because we're changing it uh -huh. right and that's where, that's where we start to implement the changes. I mean, the more consistent you are with stopping yourself and making that change, the easier it will become, and then it will just be part of the program. 
And would you say that in the beginning, it, patients are uncomfortable at first when they start to change? Because I think we oh, absolutely. get in that comfort, even if it's, even if we don't like it, we're comfortable with the current program. Absolutely. Yeah. No matter how much it hurts, it's comfortable, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, change is difficult for anyone, but you have to be, to change, you have to become uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter what it is, you know? Um, let's say you wanna change careers. It's scary to go down that path. It's scary to go back to school possibly, you know? But, and it's uncomfortable and it's scary. But once you get into it, it all starts to just roll along and you're like, why didn't I do this earlier, right? Right. Um, it's scary to make a change in relationships, scary to make a change in your daily routine because, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, if I don't do the same thing every morning, I'm going to forget something or something's going to go wrong and just going to be thrown off. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's why when I tell people to make changes, especially in their morning routine, I give them one thing at a time. Oh, mm -hmm. Just do this one thing. <laughs> one thing. Like, don't. Don't look at your cell phone the moment you wake up. Right. That could be one thing. That could be one thing. Yeah. You know, one thing and do that for two weeks. Then we'll do one more thing. Mm -hmm. You know, and then one more thing. And eventually, that's kind of the basis of my one book, Little Things Lead to Happiness. Uh -huh. People are afraid to change and they feel overwhelmed by the thought of where do I start? Right? Right. Where do I start? And maybe they feel like they have so many things they want to change. I tell people to make a list and then pick one. Uh -huh. One thing and then one thing and then one thing. Mm -hmm. And time goes by quickly, as we all know, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Before you know it, you have a whole regimen of change that you've completed and 90 days have gone by and you're like, wow, that was... That was easier than I thought, yeah. you know, and now you're on this change journey and you're ready to take on more, mm -hmm. but it's the getting started and just feeling overwhelmed by life in general and then wanting to change. Oh, I can't handle that right now. That's, <laughs> that's what I get from yeah. a lot of oh, people. Oh yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. yeah, it is, it is scary to change. Um, but you know, we work through that. Mm -hmm. Um, I use some of my methods to help people, um, the EFT or tapping, yeah. um, along with hypnotherapy and help them get through it. And I give them those tools. EFT is a nice tool to teach people. And I send them home with that tool and uh -huh. I give them the shortcuts that they need, you know, especially, uh, some of the kids that I see, uh, like 12 to 15. So you work with kids too. Uh -huh. I, I, usually work with 15 and older but there have been some exceptions uh -huh. if someone contacts me and it's for anxiety or something like that i will i will take the client mm -hmm. um, of course there's a parental form for that sure. um, but um, if someone's going to bring their child to me and ask me to hypnotize them to make them lose weight i don't take you know there's yeah. there's a certain line i have when it comes to children and what we're dealing with and I feel like when they reach 15 their their brains are at that point now where they're a little bit more logical I mean they're still in balance that's why teenagers are a little you know yeah a little off. rough <laughs> <laughs> you know but you know that's because that's that that last part of that main development right yeah. of their mm -hmm. cognitive brain and um they're you know they're a little bit confused. Uh, they have more anxiety, and that's also where there's a higher rate, unfortunately, of suicide. Uh -huh. You know, because it, it's a really rough period, and so that's why I, I say 15 and older because that's a really good age. If you if that child wants to come see me, mm -hmm. um, that's where we can start changing those thoughts and perceptions and starting to heal whatever traumas that they have, because we all have it. Sure, right? everybody's been through We're something. all walking traumas, right? right. <laughs> so, That's why it's called life, right? Exactly. <laughs> we have a lot of lessons to learn. <laughs> exactly, we all have lessons to learn. So, you know, trying to get to them early, I'm, I'm open to that, you know, but when you get younger than that, you, know, you have to be careful what it is you're working with. You sure. Know? So yeah. I give a lot of kids um, shortcuts, and something that's very subtle so that they don't feel embarrassed to do it around people. Mm -hmm. And so it's very subtle shortcuts for them and um, helping them get through tests and 
um, helping them just through general anxiety uh -huh. and little tricks that they can do that keeps them calmer throughout the day, especially at school. Yeah, because mm -hmm. peer pressure is tough. Yeah, right? absolutely. absolutely. Trying to figure out yourself. Most kids are feeling a little insecure at certain ages and then you've got people making fun of you for whatever reason because kids are mean. Yeah, for there's, sure. There's a lot. There's a lot there to being is. a kid. Yeah. There is. So, you know, I do see some kids, but most of my clients are adults. Mm -hmm. um, so when you work with kids, do you ever work with the family together? Because it seems like sometimes, and I've, I've seen this before where parents will just drop their kid off and say, he's got problems, but it's really a family dynamic. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So I do debrief with the parent or parents, um, and uh, for example, one of my clients, um, you know, I I could see that we had two different parenting styles going mm -hmm. on, mm -hmm. and I could see that this this child, very smart, knew how to work that. And so I, he's manipulating. I call them out. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I see what you're doing, uh -huh. you know, <laughs> and he just sits there and smiles and I'm like, okay, you need to stop, you know, mm -hmm. and, and we started working on some other things like, why are you doing that? You know? And, um, and then I, I spoke to the parents and now I am not a couples counselor. Mm -hmm. Um, I do refer to couples counselors. So they actually started couples counseling, marriage counseling, right? The, the parents The did. parents yeah. did. Yes. Mm -hmm. At the same time that I'm seeing their, their son, uh -huh. um, you know, so when there are certain, certain patterns and, um, when I can suspect certain things, I will, I will talk to the parents and, and I tell the ch children that what we say is confidential, right? Unless there is some concern for their safety, right? Uh -huh. If there's concern for their safety, then all bets are off. Mm -hmm. You know, I there's you know I have to say something and we have to address that. But I haven't had that situation so far. Uh huh. Thank goodness. Yeah. But, um, right. But you know but what yeah. to do if you had to. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So let's go back and let's talk about each therapy you do in sure. detail. I'd like to start with hypnotherapy because Absolutely. so many people have this idea of the pendulum. <laughs> <and you just laughs> so, yeah, I know. Um, this is not stage hypnosis. And, you know, a lot of times in stage hypnosis, there's... There, I forget the name for it, but there's a setup. Right? Actors. There's, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, you know, hypnotherapy is just a deep state of relaxation mm -hmm. and allowing your conscious mind to rest while your subconscious mind is open to suggestions. Mm -hmm. um, there are different techniques to get people to rest because people are different. Um, some people uh, are um, susceptible more to physical cues versus emotional mm -hmm. cues. And so as I'm talking to a person, I'll figure out what kind of words to use or how to phrase uh, different relaxation cues uh -huh. depending on the person um, and now it the thing about hypnosis is if you don't want it to work like if you're pushing against it it's not going to sure because you're constantly engaging your conscious mind like what is she saying why is she saying that and I, I don't want to go to sleep or I don't want to you know go in and out you know that's too scary for right. me it's not gonna work okay mm -hmm. um, so I have to see how accepting they are of it. Do you want to do this? And are you willing to go to sleep? And, you know, because they don't necessarily sleep, but most of my clients go somnambulistic, which they think they fell asleep, but they didn't quite fall asleep because their conscious mind has wandered into a dreamlike state. Uh -huh. But as soon as I count them out, they wake up. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, they weren't asleep. They were just somnambulistic. That's the deepest state of hypnosis. Now, to get people into hypnosis, some uh, some hypnotherapists will use pendulums uh -huh. because watching it makes you tired. Right. They'll use um, a, a pentameter, right? Uh -huh. um, yeah. They'll use light. Um, they'll use a candle. They'll use, you know, whatever. But um, I tend to just use the talking story, you know, progressive relaxation, uh -huh. just allowing them to just listen to my voice. And of course I have a hypno voice, right? Uh -huh. So voice changes a little bit, yeah. it's softer. I have a water feature in my office nice. and we just, you know, slowly go into it. So we don't get to the suggestion part until maybe 
10 minutes mm -hmm. into this hypnotherapy yeah. um, until they're relaxed. And then, you know, we just watch the body for cues, you know, that they're now relaxed. Mm -hmm. And then we start to go into it. And, and the subconscious mind likes metaphors. Uh, so there's a lot of stories, uh -huh. you know. Um, you know, uh, when I talk about a lake, the lake is your mind, right? Mm -hmm. So when the lake is disturbed, you know, it doesn't reflect reality. And, you know, we start to calm the waters and now it's reflecting the real you and calming yourself and you're able to see exactly what needs to be healed, you know, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So we use a lot of metaphors in hypnotherapy, uh -huh. um, like shedding armor, like you're taking off armor because you're you're so protected, you know, uh -huh. you're protecting yourself so much or walls, obviously, I mean, there's a song by Pink Floyd, The Wall, right? Yeah, yeah. Building up walls and tearing them down, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. So lots of different stories and metaphors to start planting in suggestions of different, all different topics, anything from um, anxiousness, um, depression, to um, healing from IBS. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, huge. exactly. Um, inflammation or, or other inflammatory uh, conditions, mm -hmm. um, helping with cancer. Um, you know, I currently have a client who's finished up her cancer treatment. And uh -huh. when they went to remove the tumor, they said it was dying. But we had been, we had spent five months together prior to that surgery uh -huh. um, working on focusing on the tumor and how the tumor was dying and, you know, and going through and healing what possibly caused the cancer in the first place. Exactly. Yeah. You know, so, so hypnotherapy is a deep state of relaxation mm -hmm. where I tell you stories, put in some suggestions mm -hmm. and make you feel good. And when you come out of it, it's like you took a nice power nap yeah. and yeah, you're all good. And it's a more subtle change. Um, where you start to say, oh, this voice in my head saying something different. <laughs> Which is what, what you want to happen. Exactly, right? Yeah. right? That's where the programming, you know, Dr. Bruce Lipton said, mm -hmm. the way to change your subconscious is through hypnotherapy mm -hmm. and repetition. Yeah, got to keep doing it. Can't just do it once and yeah. think it's going to be all gone. Hypnotherapy, repetition. That's where the CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, yeah. repeating over and over. That's why you say the more you say something to yourself, the more you're going to believe it. Yes. And because it's the repetition, right? You're imprinting it on your subconscious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm actually going to be doing a series on consciousness. Mm. And uh, one thing that comes to mind when you say conscious subconscious is that consciousness is the most powerful force in the universe. Also, the, the more we focus on something, the more our cells change to that vibrational frequency. So. Yes. If we're constantly telling ourselves we're no good, we'll never amount to anything, then we start to manifest disease mm -hmm. because that vibration, we're low vibration at that Absolutely. point. And yeah. we stay there. If we stay there long enough, we're going to manifest pathology. Mm -hmm. But once we raise that vibration, I've said this time and time again, where disease can't live in a healthy body. So right. even cancers can go away by raising the vibration and changing yes. how you talk to yourself and your belief. Yes. Because you know, disease can't live in a healthy body. So Absolutely. once you change the vibration up here, which, you know, a cancerous tumor is vibrating down here, it has to change, mm -hmm. right? The vibration has to come to meet the high frequency yes. and the tumor can't exist in that frequency. Absolutely. Yeah. So yes. tell me some of the experiences you've had with patient clients, I'm sorry, um, with hypnosis, like some of the changes they've experienced, not only just emotionally and cognitively, but and behaviorally, but also physically? You know, um, I've had uh, clients tell me that they felt like this was their last ditch effort. Mm. Um, and they're just, they felt heavy, energetically heavy. I'm not uh -huh. saying necessarily they're overweight. Right. They could be, but you know, they just feel heavy and they look tired and they look sad and they're not taking care of themselves you, know, you can tell and and um, I had a client like that and after the first session she was just amazed at how she felt afterwards now 
granted that's in combination because I didn't do just hypnotherapy mm -hmm. but um, the next time she came in she was her hair was done she looked so good and she was smiling and I'm like wow it's only been a week I'm like how are you doing she goes I feel so good uh -huh. you know I, I'm like I don't know if you noticed but I fixed my hair today I'm like yes I did you look very nice um, I've had another client same thing happened uh, she came to me because she kept ruminating on some past trauma um, and unfortunately this happens a lot but uh, she was raped mm -hmm. um, like a year prior and she just really did not feel good about herself she said she gained weight and you know she just didn't feel good and so we went through a session and because between session one and two I like to only have one week go by after mm -hmm. that we can work on you know cycle time mm -hmm. you know every two weeks or whatever it depends on what they're dealing with mm -hmm. so the next week she came in and she looked so good and she was smiling and so physically you see them change they're yeah. shifting and they're brighter they're smiling they're taking care of themselves because mm -hmm. they care you yeah. know whereas when they get into these places they just don't they don't want to look at themselves. Mm -hmm. They don't. They don't care. You yeah. know what? What it is? They just want to survive at that point. Right. So as as we start healing some of those things, they start caring. Mm -hmm. And one of their assignments I usually give people mm -hmm. is, uh, okay, when you're at home, I want you to look yourself in the mirror, have a box of tissues, because <laughs> it's going <laughs> to be emotional. Right. And these are the things I want you to say. And it's different for each person. It depends on who, what they're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Right. And, um, and it's, as I said, and some people report, they can't even say it. They just stand there and look at themselves. Uh -huh. And that's fine. Try again the next day. Mm -hmm. Try again the next day. Try again the next day. Eventually you'll be able to say it. Yeah. You know, and it's, and you'll cry. But you know what? Crying is healthy. Yeah, right. It releases mm -hmm. so much and a lot of toxins from your body. Right. That you're holding on to that's related to those negative emotions and feelings. Yeah, right. Right. So you want to let that go. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, yeah, physically I see changes in people um, as they start start my therapy. So that's, that's nice. yeah. And that's expected, right? Because I mean, absolutely. It, it's the, the whole biochemistry of the sure. body changes and the energy. Yeah. yeah, and I know I've, I've sent quite a few of my patients to you, and what I find as a doctor is that healing, there's blocks in healing, Yes. and it's not the treatment plan that I've designed for the patient. Right. It's their ability to get past these blocks to sure. actually move into healing, and I know I've had a variety of patients with different blocks. I've had patients that are getting some kind of benefit from being sick, you know, because they need to be cared for. Right. That's huge, and... Or they just don't believe they can get better because they've been sick for so long. So there's right. there's a variety of reasons why people don't get well. And I'm a big advocate of hypnotherapy, this kind of therapy in general, just to help people unblock those those you know I beliefs. I love that the the first example you gave me is some people you know want to be cared for. Um, you know, uh, some people call it the victim mentality. I actually call it out in my book, um, in the first chapter, why it's so hard to change, and for you to do some introspection. And one of those is because you're addicted to being the victim. Right. So let me stop you for a minute. Tell me about your books real quick. Because, yes, absolutely. Because I want everybody to know about your books. Um, so my my book that's for everyone is called Little Things Lead to Happiness. Um, a lot of people ask me because I have my own story, my mm -hmm. own journey that's mm -hmm. quite interesting. Um, and people who have known me for a long time and who know my story, they ask, well, how did you, how did you get to this point where you're so calm most of the time? <laughs> and, you know, you always smile and, you know, you're living your best life, mm -hmm. you know, living in balance. I'm like, it was a journey. But I started with one thing at a time. Yeah. One thing at a time. Of course, I had my wake-up call moment, right? We all have that dark night of the soul, right? Right. Um, and and that's when I decided to take one step at a time. So 
The book talks about why it's so hard to change. It defines mindfulness, mm -hmm. you know, what we talked about. Yeah. And then how the book works. And it's a 90-day journey. And it's a working journal. Because I find a lot of people want something to track. Something right. to write in. Now, you don't have to write in the book. You can keep a journal in parallel mm -hmm. instead of writing in the book. It's up to you. But it gives you little things. And it starts to progress. Um, starting with take two minutes in the morning to meditate. And your first meditation is breathe and count. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's all I want you to do. And, you know, different things, different affirmations, your gratitude, all that. Mm -hmm. And it takes you through and it progresses more and more over the 90 days. So at the end of 90 days, you can look back and say, look at what I've done, you know, but also being compassionate with yourself. So there's a check-in every week. What went well? What did it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And knowing, you know what? I'm not perfect, but I did a lot. I didn't do everything, but yeah. I did a lot. Mm -hmm. So this next week, I want to do more, you know? So it's just a check-in and then continuing on. And that's, that's basically what that book is. Uh -huh. My other book is a booklet. Okay. Specifically for people managers. Um, so before I switched careers, I spent almost 20 years in corporate America uh -huh. for a Fortune 100 company. Yeah. And I was a global leader for their, um, for their self-service platform. And so I had employees that were not local they were in other countries, other cultures. I dealt with uh, people in many countries, um, and everybody wanted to be on my team. Mm -hmm. And I was seen as a very strong people manager. And as I was getting ready to leave, because you know, I said, "All right, I'm switching careers now." Mm -hmm. um, there was a purpose to my timing, and uh, people from different departments that I'd worked with for years said. Are you gonna write a book on how you did it? <laughs> how I did what? You know? And then I because you know this this is a stressful environment and you're usually so calm. I mean, not always, come on, I'm not perfect, but usually so calm and people, you know, you always bring like common sense to the table and you know, your people that you develop, you know, they they love you and they keep, you know, I even keep in contact with people that had left my team and moved uh -huh. on because I encouraged them to, um, you know, are you going to, how are you going to, you know, communicate how you did it? And I said, well, okay, I didn't think about doing that, mm -hmm. but all right, if you guys want a book and thinking about being a people manager, we don't have time for long books. Right. Let's get to the point. <laughs> right. So this booklet is 60 pages long and uh -huh. it gets to the point. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's broken down in sections to help with how I looked at my employees. And it is called Managing with Compassion uh, or Leading with Compassion, a Manager in Constant Conflict mm. in a Corporate Environment. Mm -hmm. Because when you're in a corporate environment and you're a manager or a leader, you have to meet the needs of the corporation who is an unfeeling entity. Right. Okay. But you also have people that you have to have compassion for and think about developing and what their needs are and that each person is an individual. You can't just cookie cutter how to manage people. Right. And that's, that's what I try to explain to people. When I deal with my one employee in India versus another employee in Mexico, their life circumstances are different, mm -hmm. their personalities are different, what motivates them is different, and so you have to shift when you're dealing with each one of your employees. Mm -hmm. um, even my indirect reports, you know, because I ran a platform, so not only did I have direct reports of around 20 people, but I also had indirects of 30 mm -hmm. or more, depending. So I have to get to know everyone and what makes them motivated, what makes them feel fulfilled, but what are their goals in life, you know? Right. And so the book goes through that, and then also how to take care of yourself. Don't forget. That's important. As a manager, <laughs> you need to take care of yourself because it is, it can conflict with you internally that your internal or strong morals and integrity 
may push against what the corporation is trying to do mm -hmm. without getting into detail but right but you have to back it because you're the manager how do you implement that with compassion right mm -hmm. and so it can be very stressful on a people manager um, and and that can lead to disease right yeah oh yeah and so I tell them, I tell them I have a whole section on self-care and it goes into the things that I have done for myself, including what you eat, your sleep. Mm -hmm. A lot of people sacrifice sleep to get other things done. Yeah. I don't think people realize how important sleep is. Yeah. It is so important. Very important. Now we could do a whole podcast on sleep. Oh yeah, we could. It's, it's so important. Mm -hmm. um, so the book actually is a get to the point how can you work on leading with compassion, become a better people manager? Mm -hmm. And that's what that book is. Yeah, and so tell me what finalized your decision to transition from being this manager of a corporation <laughs> to what you're doing now? I think yeah. I'm really fascinated by that. You know, my life has its own story. Um, I've always been, a, I was a quiet child. Um, I was very introspective and observant. Mm -hmm. I loved watching people, listening to people, listening to new words. I liked wondering why people did the things they did mm -hmm. or didn't do the things they did. And so I was always interested in human behavior. Um, I had uh, I had my own pressures from my parents to go down a path that made me money uh -huh, right <laughs> because you know I am a Gen Xer so you know it's a you know that's my my trauma uh -huh. and so I went through high school intending to be uh, an orthopedic surgeon oh. so I did every medical every science class I could mm -hmm. through high school and entered college as um, pre-med uh -huh. um, my gross anatomy you know this is why I have a lot of medical knowledge too and why right. I understand the function of the body uh -huh. but then I decided um, hey I'm the one paying for my education <laughs> yeah. nobody else is mm -hmm. I want to do psychology uh -huh. so that's when I shifted to psychology and I graduated with my degree but during that time I met my uh, my daughter's father oh. and you know life took an interesting turn because and how old were you at this time um well I married him when I was 24 okay okay so we got married uh, we were both 24 uh, I didn't have my daughter until I was 29 but it was a very interesting um, toxic marriage mm. um, now I don't hold anything against him a lot of people are saying don't you regret marrying him oh. um, you know what? We're all on our own path. Sure. He, has, he has a right to change just like I do. Sure. Exactly. So, and, and I'm glad to say I've seen great improvements in him. I don't talk to him often, but, you know, my daughter's like, oh my gosh, dad is different, you know, and, you know, he, he's doing his thing and that's great. But, but that took me on a different path and mm -hmm. I got pressure from him to make money. So I ended up on this path of just going down corporation after corporation, right? Um, so when I divorced him, my daughter was eight years old. She uh -huh. was almost nine. And I was already into my tenure at this Fortune 100 company. Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, I will stay here and make this good money to make sure that my daughter gets her bachelor's degree with no debt. That's yeah, that's admirable. So, <laughs> as time went on, my daughter is very, and she's working on her PhD right now, just so you know. Mm -hmm. um, as she was coming up, and we were getting ready for the spring, her last semester, the spring semester, she was going to graduate with her bachelor's in May, I did my reflection, and I said, okay, I think it's time. I'm, I'm going to shift. I'm going to change. And then actually, I did that a year prior where I decided, and then COVID hit. Oh. <laughs> so it was all coordinated with COVID. And I said, I'm going to get my hypnotherapy certification mm -hmm. while I was still working at this yeah. corporate job, EFT. And I said, I'm going to do what I want to do now. Mm -hmm. And so she, I left my corporate job. A month later, she graduated, and I was 
100% shifted <laughs> into a new career, wow. which makes me very happy. And, and talking about taking risks and making changes, I mean... Absolutely. And don't you think that's empowering for anybody sure. when they actually step out of their comfort zone and accomplish something that yeah. they didn't maybe know they could accomplish or even think about before. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, and I tell people it's never too late to change. Right. And you know, while I was in corporate America, people would be shocked that I didn't have an IT degree because of my position. I'm like, I have a psychology degree. <laughs> <laughs> I have a psych degree. I use it all the time. Um, <laughs> you know, but so I beware. <laughs> I worked on myself. I worked on, you know, really being aware of how I communicate with people. Um, learning how to present better, um, how to communicate more efficiently uh -huh. um, and directly so that I wasn't misunderstood a, as much as I was used to being misunderstood. Um, you know, because I was a quiet child. Right. So I, and I was encouraged to be quiet. So communicating was difficult for me. Um, but that 20 years at that company taught me a lot. Um, and I grew as a person in my personal life as well. Um, so it was a it was a good development time. I also got my yoga teacher certification during that time, mm -hmm. and qigong um, qi, qigong teaching experience. Um, you know, I, all of that came together during that twenty years. Uh -huh. So you know, it was all worth it, and it was preparing me for this moment right. to make my shift. Yeah. Yeah. And would you say now you're fulfilling your purpose in life? Yes. You, yeah. 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 When you when you really do embrace your true purpose, um, it's it's so amazing, mm -hmm. and and you can be so busy from morning to night, but you know that you've done something that you were meant to do, mm -hmm. and really giving to other people. So it's yeah. very uh, energizing in return. And it's, it's hard for me to fathom doing something that doesn't actually help people right. with their own success, right? Yeah. 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 Let's talk about um, some of these other therapies that you do. The emotional freedom technique. I think that's, um, even I have some questions about that. Sure. So sure. I, I want you to talk about that in detail. Absolutely. Yeah. So emotional freedom techniques was created by Gary Craig uh, quite some time ago. I want to say in the um, 70s, maybe 60s, 70s. Um, I actually have a link to one of his videos in my FAQs on my website um, regarding that. Um, people call it tapping. It became very popular uh, and you would see it and then it got quiet and then it got popular again mm -hmm. and it got quiet and now I see it popping up again and again. Mm -hmm. It's starting to get popular again. Basically, it works on acupressure points mm -hmm. just like acupunctures and acupressures use. Uh -huh. Except they're very key points and you focus on specific events or emotions uh, for healing and use suggestions or talking, there are different techniques within it, to release it from your body energetically mm -hmm. and from your energy body. And that's where like shortcuts come into play, you know, like my, um, like my kid with anxiety. Um, I would tell him to pinch his ring finger uh, right, right uh -huh. here. Yeah. And then if his heart was racing, like he was going to get a panic attack, mm -hmm. to pinch his little finger right here. Mm -hmm. Because this is part of the tapping as well, when wow. we work through. There are many different tapping points and techniques. Um, sometimes if a person comes into my office and you can tell they just need someone to listen to them and to dump on you mm -hmm. for an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. I'll tell them, tap your collarbone. I'll show them the point. I'm like, just tap, keep talking, and tap. Keep talking. Just keep tapping. Keep tapping. And then I might say, okay, tap your breastbone. Keep, keep talking. Uh -huh. That's the tap and talk, mm -hmm. right? So they're actually releasing it from their body as they're venting uh -huh. or talking and really getting things off their chest, right? right? <laughs> um, you yeah. know, and so a lot of people look at me like, really, this is going to help? Or they don't think that something is an issue anymore until we start tapping through it. I've had grown men break down in tears. Mm -hmm. and, and we'll talk about something like, well, Obviously, this is still an issue for you because you're thinking about it right now. 
well, no, I think it's, you know, I've let that go. I'll tell them, well, let's try it. <laughs> and then we start to tap and they start to cry and we'll stop, which, which is nice about EFT is that your conscious mind is fully engaged. Uh -huh. So we can pause for a moment. You can grab a tissue. Okay, let's continue. And then we continue tapping, mm -hmm. continue tapping. And we can pause for a minute. You need a drink of water because they're repeating words, right? And, you know, we keep tapping, we keep tapping, then I have them take a breath. I have had so many clients email me either that night or the next morning saying, I cannot believe I have really been carrying that for so long. Mm. I feel so light. Mm -hmm. I feel so much better. It's like witchery. <laughs> you know, I, go I visit the witch. You know, it's it, you know, it they they're just amazed and sometimes it's right in the moment. Mm -hmm. They'll sit there and say, "Wow, okay, because I have them rate where do you feel it? How distressful is it on a scale of one to 10? Yeah. And I get like nine, 10, you know, they start crying. It's a 10. Okay. Uh -huh. And then once we tap through and we rate it, we tap through, tap through until we get it to a zero. And they're like, yeah, I, I, it's like, I know it happened, but I don't, I don't feel anything anymore. So once it's gone, it's gone. Or is it something that has to be repeated? Once the main issue is gone, it's gone. Now, there can be, I see it like tentacles, right? Things have generalized effects too, uh -huh. right? So if, if we resolve one main item, and let's say you came in with two main items and we resolve one, the other one may not feel as intense anymore uh -huh. because that generalized effect kind of calmed this one a little bit. I see. Um, sometimes there could be related issues. So for instance, um, I had a gentleman who had a lot of trauma with bullies and different bullies through his life. Mm -hmm. And we were, we focused on one and it was resolved. But then when he thought about the other bully, that wasn't resolved. Right. So bullying events in general, not necessarily, right? But the one person that we did resolve, he could think about them and be okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know, so you see what I mean? So. Yeah one event one experience now if we try to address anxiety in general mm -hmm. let's say okay i know i'm feeling anxious but okay that's not specific the more specific you are the more effective eft is but we can try to give you some relief by being general right right uh -huh. and so sometimes i will do a general tapping just to help give them something mm -hmm. Uh, Cause sometimes I get clients that are so distressed, they can't stop crying. Mm -hmm. And so we just start jumping into it and we just start calming themselves. And then there's another technique in tapping called tearless trauma. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I start with is I tell them, I want you to imagine taking that event. You don't have to even tell me about it. I don't need to know about it. You can give it a label, but I want you to put it in a file. Mm -hmm. And then I want you to lock it away. I don't care what it is you decide. It could be a huge, strong safe. It could be a well. It could be a oil tank. I don't care. Whatever. You decide, put it in there and lock it. Mm -hmm. And it's safe there. And it can't hurt you mm -hmm. there. And that's where we start. And then people will calm down very quickly. And then we start going through that tearless trauma process. So then it's starting to escalate it until finally they can tell me the details of the story. Mm -hmm. And we may have to stop and tap through that specific moment in the story. And then I make them back up and talk through it again. And then they can get past that point and so on. And then I tell them, okay, now let's think about this event this trauma and then they get to zero to where they don't even have anything to talk about right right yeah so they know it happened um there's also a matrix re-imprinting technique that you do with eft uh, but there are a lot of different techniques within and so if i feel like i can't get it to total zero at the mm -hmm. end of tarot's trauma then i go okay we're going to the other technique now let's finish this off right right, right. and and then we get it to zero mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's just releasing that energy from the body. And it's something that they learn. So after they've been in session with me a couple of times, 
I give them the classic with a couple extra points, right? The classic recipe it's called. And I usually give them a photo and email and then the, the order in which to tap and everything mm -hmm. and how to do the setup and all that kind of stuff so that they can do their own tapping or mm -hmm. tap in the moment or tap on other things that come up for them, you know? Um, so that they can do it themselves. That's the beauty of EFT. You can take that home with you. Yeah. And so is there certain places they tap for certain things? How, what are the specifics of the therapy? Yeah, so <clears throat> all of the points have a purpose, mm -hmm. right? So the body is, it, it's spiders with channels of energy and you know throughout the body just like veins and arteries mm -hmm. you know it it's everywhere mm -hmm. um so you have two key tapping points which is the top of your head uh -huh. and the back of your neck okay um because these link to all meridians okay okay yeah um i have one kid he loves the top of his head mm. I'm like, if the, if the point feels good, it feels good for a reason. Tap it. Mm -hmm. When you're feeling upset, tap it. Um, there are certain things about, um, like, ruminating on the past, having a lot of guilt, um, also addictions. You tap the eyebrow point, uh -huh. mm -hmm. right? Um, if you're anxious about the future, it's under the eye. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, there's, uh, if... There's like some trauma in your past that you wish you would have said something, like maybe stood up for yourself or whatever. Mm -hmm. You tap here, mm. right? Um, so there are, there are points, um, your pressure release, like a pressure cooker, mm -hmm. is your collarbone point. So this calms you a lot. There's even something called collarbone breathing. I posted on my YouTube on, you know, for free, uh, mm -hmm. how to do collarbone breathing. Um, and this, this point is your release to practice your breath and to just release, um, your healing point is your breastbone. Okay. You know, your heart meridian is your oh. little finger. Uh -huh. You know, that's why I tell people, I'm like, you know, a lot of people have panic attacks and they're not having a heart attack. Mm -hmm. They might think they're having a heart right. attack, but they're not. Mm -hmm. um, but they do use this point, even with people who are having heart attacks, uh -huh. you'll see that they'll put something on the little finger mm -hmm. or the paramedic will squeeze the pinky. Mm -hmm. This does connect to the heart meridian mm -hmm. and it will calm you. So if, you know, that's my, my free tip, if you feel like you're getting anxious, <laughs> squeeze the nail bed and it doesn't have to be hard, just a little bit doesn't matter which finger you can switch after a while uh -huh. and just kind of squeeze the tip of your little finger and breathe and your heart will start to relax and calm down mm -hmm. um, if you're feeling just jittery uh, squeeze the ring finger okay and just on the tip by the nail yep, bed right just yep. around the nail bed yep just squeeze it right there mm -hmm. and just breathe and those are my two anxiety points for my <laughs> clients but yeah, it's so every point has a purpose. There are a lot more points sure. um, and a lot more techniques, but um, every point has a purpose.